Um, and so this is going to be an overview of a work in progress on Aldo Leopold's left land ethic. And I'm working on a book and it's tentatively titled, The Land is Our Community, A Land Ethic for the New Millennium. And it's going to be a little bit different from most philosophy talks. So it's going to be a little bit more autobiographical, not super autobiographical. Um, and I'll be focusing more on the big picture of this project. I won't be getting into the specifics too much. So that's going to mean that I'm basically gesturing at a lot of arguments uh, rather than providing them in, in detail. Now, some of these arguments are in published papers. And so I can refer people to those published papers um, where appropriate. In other cases, I, there are parts of the book that I haven't really developed yet. And so some things are more new than others, I guess. And, um, and then at the end, I'll draw some general conclusions about how to think about projects like this and hint, um, I'm gonna be emphasizing the importance of interdisciplinarity. All right, so, but uh, first, who was Aldo Leopold? I don't wanna presuppose that everyone knows him, although he is very well known. And then also, uh, what is the land ethic? So Aldo Leopold was a 20th century hunter, forester, wildlife manager, ecologist, conservationist, and professor. So he wore a lot of different hats during his life and those different hats very much influence the ideas he developed in the land ethic, which came at the end of his life. And so, so this is the thing that he's best known for is the book that was published uh, right after his death, A Sand County Almanac. And the land ethic is in that book. It comes at the very end of the book. But even though that's what he's most well known for, he was actually a very prolific writer. He has more than 500 published works and many unpublished ones. And uh, these were directed to all different types of audiences, scientific, foresters, farmers, et cetera. Uh, the, the land ethic itself, the same County Almanac itself was written for a general audience. And so he's been extremely influential, not just in environmental ethics, but also in conservation biology and many related fields like forestry, wildlife management and restoration ecology. Um, okay, so that was my brief, who is Aldo Leopold? Now my brief, who is the land ethic? Um, so I'm gonna be talking about what the land ethic is. So it's hard to know where to start, but here's some essential quotations that will at least give a starting point if you're not familiar with it. So all ethics so far evolved rest upon a single premise that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. The land ethic simply enlarges the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, and animals, or collectively, the land. A land ethic changes the role of homo sapiens from conqueror of the land community to plain member and citizen of it. It implies respect for one's fellow members and also respect for the community as such. A land ethic then reflects the existence of an ecological conscience, and this in turn reflects a conviction of individual responsibility for the health of the land. Health is the capacity of the land for self-renewal. Conservation is our effort to understand and preserve this capacity. Okay, and I've highlighted some of the terms that I'm gonna be talking about more, community, interdependence, um, respecting one's fellow members, as well as respect for the community as such, and, and land health. These are going to be things that I talk more about as I go through. Um, so how did I come to care about the land ethic? This is the autobiographical part. Well. I do come from more of a philosophy of biology, history of biology background, but I was teaching environmental ethics for many years. And Leopold's land ethic is a standard part of the curriculum. It's in all the textbooks. Um, also standard is J. Baird Callicott's interpretation of the land ethic. That is also in many of the textbooks and in many courses. So what Callicott claims is that in the land ethic, in the essay, The Land Ethic, Leopold is drawing on Charles Darwin's evolutionary account of ethics. So he's inheriting Darwin's view, which was itself derived from David Hume and, and Smith, that ethics rest on feelings or sentiments that, are, that come from group selection. So the idea is that the moral basis for our obligations towards each other uh, come from our moral sentiments towards each other, right? That's the basis. So on this view, on Calicott's interpretation of Leopold, 
these moral sentiments toward the land community would be automatically triggered when we become ecologically literate. And so then we would have obligations to the land community. Um, and so then on, again, on this interpretation of Calicott's, our positive sentiments toward the land community based on an evolutionary process would be the reason we have obligations toward the land community. Now, this may be a, a fine view, but what puzzled me in teaching it was that I couldn't find any textual evidence for it. And my students would ask me, where is, where is Calicott getting this interpretation? And I, I kept having to say, I don't know, I don't see it. So I ended up just stopping teaching that essay of Calicott's because I couldn't really explain it to the students. So then I had kind of a lucky day <laughs> many years later. So uh, I was teaching philosophy of biology and in that class I was teaching Darwin's chapter on struggle for existence. And then the same day I was teaching environmental ethics and I was teaching Leopold's land ethic. And it was like this light bulb went off. I suddenly realized they were talking about the same thing. So Leopold is talking about, you know, he says all ethics so far evolved uh, rest upon a single premise that the individual is a member of a community of interdependent parts. And interdependency plays a huge role in the essay, The Land Ethic. He's constantly talking about dependencies between species. In chapter three of Darwin's Origin of Species, he's talking again, just like Leopold, or Leopold, just like Darwin, is talking about dependence between different species in the struggle for existence. And Darwin gives examples like the dependency of mistletoe on trees and birds, or the dependency of number of predators on number of prey. So I wrote an essay and I argued that Leopold was influenced not by Darwin the ethicist, as Calicott had said, but rather Darwin the ecologist, Darwin's ecological ideas, where he's discussing the interactions and the interdependencies between species. Okay, so that was the beginning, but then I came to realize there was another problem. Now, Calicott had identified uh, the following as the summary moral maxim of Leopold's land ethic. And these are probably the two most commonly quoted sentences of, of the whole essay. A thing is right uh, when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community or land community. He uses those interchangeably. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. Okay, so one problem with this summary moral maxim is it seems to imply that actions are wrong if they don't benefit the entire community. And that seems to imply that we should be sacrificing the individual to benefit the community. And that seems problematic. Um, so Calicott at first, you know, bit the bullet on the extreme claim, but then later backed off on it. Um, another problem with thinking this is a summary moral maxim is that uh, it raises questions. Okay, what is this integrity? What is stability? What's the land community? These don't have explicit definitions within the essay. And so if you think those, are, those two sentences are key and then those concepts have to be key, but what do they mean? Uh, but I came to realize that it's a mistake to laser focus on those two sentences and also a mistake to read them too literally. That it, we, what we need to do is understand the land ethic uh, through Leopold's other writings and also the context of his life. Okay. So, uh, so that was a negative part of the project. Uh, I, then I started to realize, well, that's really only the tip of the iceberg because there's a bunch of new questions that, that crop up. So first, what's interdependence, right? Now that's center stage. If we're not relying on moral sentiments to ground the land ethic, then it's interdependence. But what does that mean? What's the land community? What does that consist of? What's land health? What does that consist of? And then finally, if not moral sentiments, what's the basis for Leopold's land ethic? So I'll talk about each of those. Again, I'm kind of at this very high level, so not in any detail. Uh, so first, interdependence. So um, start with some examples to motivate the idea. Uh, one example of interdependence is a food chain. So um, a squirrel that drops an acorn, which feeds a quail, which feeds a horned owl, which feeds a parasite. But Leopold makes clear that it's not just food chains that, are, um, that count for interdependency. The oak grows not only acorns, it grows fuel, browse, hollow dens, leaves, and shade on which many species depend for food and cover or other services, right? So all kinds of uh, relationships, including um, you know, shade and shelter and things like that count as interdependence for Leopold. 
He also includes humans and our domesticated species. Each species, including ourselves, is a link in many chains. The deer eat 100 plants other than oak and the cow 100 plants other than corn. Both then are links in 100 chains. And abiotic components are included as well, not just, so not just the species. Um, and here, Leopold gives the example of livestock grazing in the Southwest, which led to Southwest US, I should clarify, uh, led to a progressive and mutual deterioration, not only of plants and soils, but of the animal community subsisting thereon. Okay, so, so more generally, um, uh, you know, aside from these specific examples, Leopold says that lines of dependency include predations, exploitations, services, or parasitism. And that's what's outlined in this diagram on the right. Some, some more examples of these in, interconnected um, lines of dependency. So contemporary example of this would be bees. So a huge percentage of crops and native flowers depend on various bee species for pollination. And then in turn, humans and non-human animals are dependent on those for food. Um, unfortunately, uh, today many bee species are threatened by our actions. So human caused global climate changes as well as pesticide use. So uh, there's a line of dependency here from humans to bees, to plant species, to humans and other animals. Uh, to continue the bee example, um, as, as I've kind of indicated, many of our interactions with bees are negative or harmful. And it might sound funny, but those are those negative interactions make bees dependent on what we do or fail to do. It makes them vulnerable. So that's it. Even those negative interactions are types of interdependencies. Now, of course, it's also open to us to interact with bees in positive ways to promote them. But so these interactions that underlie dependence, interdependencies can be negative or positive. Um, now, these same interactions affect other species like flowers or crops indirectly. So interactions can be direct or indirect, and then they can also affect the species that depend on them. So there's sort of these downstream effects. Now, you've also got soil and water in there. They might seem to be playing a background role, but those are key factors. Those uh, soil and water very much affect plant growth and our actions likewise affect the ability of soil and water to, to do their job. So all of these things are in the mix. So in short, you know, lines of dependency, yes, and Leopold talked about that, but he also talked about webs of interdependencies. And so bees are really part of these, of larger webs of interdependencies with humans and plants and animals and soils and waters that they interact with. Okay, so here's the upshot. I'll just gloss over this fairly quickly. Um, this is the sort of the more formal capturing of what I've just said. So interdependence includes the direct and indirect um, effects. It includes both negative and positive interactions. Um, these yield vulnerabilities. And again, it includes both biotic and abiotic components uh, forming webs of interactions or interdependencies. Okay, so, but uh, thinking about webs of interdependencies, that kind of raises the question, okay, now it sounds like we might be talking about these land communities that, that Leopold was interested in or biotic communities. But that brings up two more questions. First of all, what are the characteristics of these land communities? And secondly, how do we know which entities and processes are included in a given community and which ones aren't? In other words, how should we understand the boundaries of these communities? So I'll take the first question first. What are the characteristics of um, land communities? But we need a little bit of background to understand where Leopold was coming from. So in today's terms, um, we see two different subfields within ecology. There are a number of subfields, but two in particular are relevant. One is community ecology, where we're looking at communities. And in community ecology, we study the interactions and interdependencies between different species populations, right? I've already been emphasizing that um, as we've gone on. So, so we're, we're looking at species populations, you know, the, the bees and the flowers and how they interact. 
But ecosystem ecology studies ecosystems, which is a slightly different notion than community. And here it's kind of at a more abstract level. We're at the matter and energy flow level. So the, the, the organisms and their populations kind of drop out. And here you might just think about the matter and energy that's exchanged between uh, bees and flowers. Okay. Um, so, these, so there's these two different approaches in contemporary ecology. And what some environmental ethicists try to do is to say, oh, he must be talking about communities. Oh, well, um, that notion is outdated. And, um, and you know, uh, Frederick Clements was an ecologist of Leopold's time. And, and so we should, reject, we should reject Leopold because he was relying on this outdated notion of community. Um, other people tried to pigeonhole him into this ecosystem notion. They found problems with that and again, rejected him on that account. My argument is that Leopold doesn't really fit squarely within either of these traditions. Um, he was kind of a, an independent thinker and he developed his own conception that he called land community or biotic community. And it incorporates aspects of what today we call community ecology, as well as aspects of what uh, we would today call ecosystem ecology. So, Again, some of the things that sound like community ecology, um, I've emphasized already, individuals a member of a community of interdependent parts and the land ethic enlarging the boundaries of the community to include soils, waters, plants, animals, or collectively the land. Other things he says sound like ecosystem ecology where he's emphasizing not the interactions, but the, the fountain of energy flowing through a circuit of soils, plants and animals with food chains being the living channels that conduct energy upward and death and decay returning that energy to the soil. Okay, so his, his notion of land community is a blend of these two different concepts. Now, you might think that, uh, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a wacky thing to do. Why, why would he do that? Well, it turns out that there's other ecologists today who have blended those two views. Um, and so there's not such an unusual thing to actually have done. And so he, you know, his view of land communities might not be the mainstream view, but it's not outdated. It's not Clements's community as organism. And it's not idiosyncratic either. So, so again, some of the reasons I think people have rejected his views uh, were hasty. So, okay, so that's the sort of what are land communities. Then, then there was the boundary question. So um, turning to that, Leopold actually doesn't give us much guidance on how to think about boundaries, but Whatever, however we think about them, we already know that it, both interdependencies and matter energy flows are going to be playing a role. Now, luckily for us though, some contemporary ecologists who likewise blend these ideas have thought about this exact issue. So um, first consider that some systems are well bounded while others are open. Now notice I'm not saying closed. There are no closed systems in ecology, but some are fairly well bounded, whereas some are quite open. And so it's going to be that the well bounded systems are fairly uh, easy to identify their boundaries, but the open systems, it's hard to identify their boundaries. So when you have the well-bounded systems like a lake or an island, then the sort of the ecosystem approach and the community approach coincide, right? You've got your interactions kind of are, are in the same geographical area that your matter and energy flows are. And so then it's, it's relatively straightforward to delineate the boundaries of the system, right? You're, everything, everything matches up. But, um, and the idea in, in such a case, so is that the interactions among organisms are typically stronger and um, the, the cycling of material and energy is typically tighter within the physical boundaries of the system uh, than, than outside. And so the boundaries are kind of defined by the strength of the interactions and the strengths of the matter energy flows because there's a differential within and outside. Okay, so that's our, that's our straightforward case. But the harder case, again, is the open systems where 
you don't have the interactions coinciding with the matter and energy flows. So example would be if you've got resources coming from the outside where the species are not interaction. So maybe they're coming from upstream. Um, and so then it's hard to know where to draw the boundary of the land community. Um, but the authors I'm relying on, Post et al., they describe some, I think, uh, good scenarios for how we should handle these open systems. So one kind of case is suppose you've got large inputs coming from the outside, what, what you might think is the outside, at very short time scales. So an example would be like a highly mobile organism like geese is moving large amounts of nutrients around the landscape through their guano. So they're moving nitrogen and phosphorus through their guano. And then lakes and wetlands and streams are receiving those nutrients. So the question is, should we include those geese as part of uh, the land community or not? Well, if they're bringing in large amounts uh, at short time scales, then, then the geese ought to be included, right? They are still part of the system, even if you might not have initially on your initial look have thought they were part, right? They're very much affecting the future of that, that system. On the other hand, suppose that you've got an internal cycling of matter and energy that's very much stronger than any external inputs, right? Again, there's no closed system. So there's always gonna be some external input, but suppose that internal cycling of matter and energy is very much stronger than any external input. So an uh, example would be a watershed that's visited by only a few mobile organisms, or it itself has a very high productivity. In those cases, then you, you go small, you consider that smaller unit, the internal cycling, that's what dictates the boundaries of the land community. And what this approach does is it puts both interactions and matter and energy flows at the center. And, and in doing that, it has the advantage of including all the significant causally relevant factors for the future states of the populations and of the abiotic components. Now, not all causal factors, but all the significant causally relevant factors get included. And that's going to mean this approach gives us more accurate predictions if we're trying to decide what we should do about a particular system or land community. I think another benefit of this uh, approach is that it's comprehensive. So it's going to focus our attention on all the relevant aspects of a system. Um, if if it's um, if you only focus on the matter and energy flow, then uh, you might be a little bit oblivious to species going extinct, and that could be problematic. On the other hand, if you are just looking at the preservation of species and not paying attention to the matter and energy flow, then again, you're kind of missing something important about the system. Uh, my claim is that both of these, both matter and energy flow and species, are essential to what we have to consider once we turn to thinking about conservation of land communities, right? We need, to, we need to think about conserving both species as well as these important matter and energy flows. Okay, so again, this is sort of the formalization of that. And again, I won't spend a lot of time on it because I'll just be repeating myself. But again, uh, the, the characterization of a Leopold land community is includes both the matter and energy flows and the interactions. We have the characterization of the well-bounded systems, which is pretty straightforward. And then the characterization of boundaries of the open systems, which is more complicated. But here again, we include you know, the, the larger, the larger uh, inputs if they are coming in very strongly, right? If they're uh, having a large effect on the, the local system what we might otherwise have thought was the local system. Okay, so, um, but I, I said something about converse, conservation a moment ago. And so if what we're trying to do is conserve these land communities, that raises again, another question, what is it that we're trying to conserve? And so that, that brings us to land health. So as I mentioned earlier, a lot of environmental ethicists have written about Leopold's claim that we should act so as to promote the stability of the land communities. There's been a lot of things written about stability. Um, but 
these environmental ethicists, just in the same way that they assume that Leopold meant what other ecologists meant by community, many of them assume that Leopold meant by stability, what other e ecologists meant by stability. And then again, his views got quickly rejected because they were seen as outdated, right? If you have an outdated notion of stability, then why should I endorse uh, your position? But I think just as with land community, Leopold is using the term stability in a particular way. And I think to understand his meaning, you have to go beyond that so-called summary moral maxima thing is right when it tends to preserve integrity, stability, beauty of the body community is wrong when it tends otherwise. You have to go beyond that to understand what he meant by stability. It isn't what other people of his time meant. So he didn't mean unchanging. He didn't even mean dynamic equilibrium. And one of the things is that Leopold very often talked about changing ecosystems. So for example, he studied and described um, the effects of fire and drought. And he was interested in changes, uh, but what he was concerned about was understanding the difference between slow and mild changes that land communities could easily adjust to, right? Those he took to be expected and normal and fine, generally speaking, but then he's contrasting those with rapid and drastic changes. So he is concerned with change, but it's not all change, it's just certain types of change. change. And this, this is because rapid and drastic changes led to situations like the Dust Bowl of the 1930s in the Midwestern prairies of Canada and US. And Leopold saw this as, you know, the Dust Bowl as exhibiting land that had lost its stability. So, okay, so Leopold's not, not concerned with keeping land the same over time. So what is he concerned with? Well, what he does is he uses stability almost interchangeably with land health. So what's land health? Um, for Leopold, the Dust Bowl represented a lack of land health. It represented land sickness. When soil loses fertility or washes away faster than it forms, and when, um, when water systems exhibit abnormal floods and shortages, the land is sick. Now, even given land that was as sick as the Dust Bowl was, he did wonder if it were possible to restore, for example, the wasting soils of the Dust Bowl by planting prairie flowers. Um, and restoration was a emphasis uh, of Leopold's later in his life. He restored his own land in Wisconsin. He planted, he and his family planted thousands of trees and shrubs, and then they died, and then they had to replant. So, so he, he very much was interested in taking sick land and turning it into healthy land. So contemporary examples of this, um, one big one would be the 1995 restoration of wolves to Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. So this was a situation where when they brought the wolves back to Yellowstone, it controlled the elk populations. The elk populations had gotten very large, bringing the wolves in controlled the size of the elk populations. And that allowed many other interdependent species to flourish, right? And suddenly they had uh, more plants and food and, and healthier water, more carbons and nutrients uh, retained. So this was an example of, uh, or this is in a contemporary example where bringing the wolves into the system allowed land to be able to better sustain life over time. In other words, it restored land health where it had been lost by um, getting rid of the wolves. Another contemporary example is the worldwide problem of overfishing, uh, more specifically in the Northwest Atlantic. There are a lot of species that are interdependent with cod. And so when the cod were fished out, then these other species disappeared as well. And again, that is accompanied by a loss of matter and energy flow. Now here, people have tried to do restoration efforts, but they've been very sluggish. And it's been really hard to get these systems to support life. So land health has been elusive in these cases. So what's the upshot here is that uh, by land health, what Leopold meant, right? So what's the focus of conservation? The focus of conservation is to preserve and maintain land health 
which is the ability of the land to continue to sustain life over time, its capacity for self-renewal. And Leopold had some ideas about how uh, that, you know, what it is about um, biodiversity that would allow it to continue to sustain life over time. We can come back to that if, if people want. But um, the idea is that, you know, the general thought is that Leopold thought that long and diverse food chains would help promote uh, land health. Okay, so Leopold thought we should act to preserve and restore health of land communities. But why? Why should we do that, right? We, were, we need to know the why. So um, these are the earlier quotations I had up. I won't uh, read through them again because some of them you've heard a few times already. Individual member of a community of interdependent parts, land ethic, um, but you know now we're expanding the boundaries of the community um, because of those new, newly recognized interdependencies. Uh, land ethic implying respect for one's fellow members and also respect for the community as such. And then uh, land ethic uh, bringing about individual responsibility for the health of the land with again, as I just said, health being the capacity of the land for self renewal. All right, so here's some other quotations that I think are important from Leopold. An ethic ecologically is a limitation on the freedom of action and the struggle for existence. An ethic philosophically is a differentiation of social from antisocial conduct, right? So, so Leopold thought that ethics tell us uh, what, what we can't do, right? Uh, what, what we should prevent us from doing. And we already accept these in our human communities. Whereas the first death ethics dealt with the relation between individuals and later ethics dealt with the relation between the individual and society. There is as yet no ethic dealing with humanity's relation to land and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. It is the third step in a sequence, right? So I've got this kind of diagrammed on the right. Uh, Leopold is arguing for an expansion. Um, you know, we've already have ethics dealing with individuals and individuals in society. And now he wants to expand uh, to include relations between individuals in the biotic community. Leopold also believed that the land has value, stating I, of course, mean something far broader than mere economic value. I mean value in the philosophical sense, which some authors have taken him to mean intrinsic value. Okay, so what's the upshot here? What's, what's Leopold's argument? I think what's implicit in all of these quotes is you can see it as an argument from analogy or argument from consistency. I think it kind of works either way. But the idea is that um, if you see interdependence as the basis for ethics, and if you think that given interdependence between humans, we accept the value of human communities, and we also accept limitations on our actions, we accept rules of conduct to benefit and protect those communities, and that our ethical theories are kind of capturing these rules of conduct, right? If you, if you accept that interdependence between humans um, leads to accepting these ethical prescriptions, um, then, okay, now ecology has something to tell you. We're not just interdependent with other humans, we're also interdependent with other species. We're also interdependent with abiotic components like soil and waters that we don't just form human communities, we also form land communities. So if we accept these rules in our human communities, consistency demands, we ought to recognize that our land communities, that they also have value and that we ought to accept an ethical theory that benefits and protects them, that preserves and restores their land health. Okay, I think that's the, I think his argument is actually fairly simple and straightforward. And I think that's, that's the gist of it. Again, happy to come back to that. Uh, it does have some presuppositions built in that I haven't argued for. One is, you know, again, if you're going to drive this argument from consistency, it presupposes that human communities are of value. Um, at a minimum, I think this is a widely accepted claim. Again, happy to talk about that more. Uh, maybe more controversially is the claim that land communities are sufficiently analogous to human communities to drive this argument. And here I think it's important to remember that many of our interdependencies between humans are actually survival related, uh, particularly between family members, but also in our day-to-day -day lives. And if the pandemic 
has not brought that home in a horrible, uh, clear way, then I'm, I'm not sure what will. Um, okay, so those are the sort of some of the big questions I'm going to be looking at in this project that I've given you the overview of. Here's some other questions that I, I won't get into, but again, happy to dive in a little bit if, if folks are interested. So um, what sort of value should we um, understand land communities to have? I, you know, I said they have value on Leopold's uh, view, but is that intrinsic value or instrumental value or both? Um, another question to be addressed is how we should understand what Leopold means by species functions and land community functioning. These are related to the land health, land health topic, and I have written on this a bit. And then how can or can Leopold's land ethic be used as a guide for policy decision making? And in particular, people always ask, well, what should we do when some actions would benefit land communities but harm individuals and, and vice versa? That's always a concern. Uh, because as I think I hinted at, on my reading of Leopold, he values both individuals and communities, but there could be conflicts. So how um, will those conflicts be resolved? And that's, those are, that's another question that I won't get into today, but, but will be addressed in this project. Okay, so now I'll go even more abstract into some reflections on my project. In the beginning, understanding Darwin's role in Leopold's thinking, that was just my main focus. I was really confused about where Calicott was coming from. And it made it clear to me that we needed a new argument for the land ethic. And that new argument seemed to be based on interdependence, right? That seemed to be the main theme of the land ethic and what he's what he wants us to take away from it to understand why we should have these obligations to land communities. Uh, but it was um, because other philosophers had written about what does land community mean and what was stability mean, it was obvious to me that I was gonna have to defend him if I was gonna defend this. Um, and I was gonna have to come up with accounts that were not so easily dismissed um, as, as others had dismissed them. Um, but as I tried to suggest before, I think that what happened was environmental ethicists had made some pretty quick assumptions about what Leopold meant by community and stability, and that they were quick to dismiss him as outdated. And again, the problem was that they assumed that Leopold just meant what other scientists meant, rather than taking a history and philosophy of science approach, looking at Leopold's use of these terms across multiple essays and also in even in, in the context of his life. Um, now, an added bonus of this project for me is that these terms like community and stability are not only under discussion um, in ecology, they're also uh, hot topics in philosophy of ecology and and all this in, in addition to environmental ethics. So there's been a number of recent conferences and publications on this topic. So I think this project has um, relevance you know, beyond environmental ethics. And I think that working on Leopold's land ethic can shed light on these current topics and fields and vice versa. Now, um, if, at first I was kind of taking interdependence for granted. And then as I talked with more people, I realized, no, that needs analysis too. And I think that's likewise a topic that has relevance for ecology and philosophy of ecology, as well as environmental ethics. So in other words, understanding Leopold's land ethic requires an interdisciplinary approach that includes not just environmental ethics, but also history and philosophy of science and ecology. Thus understood, Leopold's land ethic can be properly incorporated into environmental ethics and conservation biology, where it has and continues to be extremely influential. With the ongoing climate crisis, rapid extinction of species, and loss of habitat, we need more than ever to understand that we cannot just focus on ourselves without recognizing all the biotic and abiotic entities that we are interdependent with. Thanks. <laughs>